Welcome to tonight's final discussion, uh, Rediscovering Urban Green Spaces. Um, so I'm Sora Boyle. I'm the Responsive Programme Coordinator at OpenEye Gallery and the Creative Producer of Look Climate Lab, which is our current program, program at OpenEye. Um, so we're exploring how we can come more uh, actively involved in making change, recognising progress and making climate change a more understandable topic. Um, so the Climate Lab has been running in the gallery since the 13th of January and it'll run until the 20th of March and it includes a series of exhibitions and events where we've invited partners to take over the gallery and our online spaces and to use these as a lab space to present projects and share the process of their research. So we're looking at five themes for the lab, energy, materials, transport, nature and food. Um, and this programme will inform our learning and thinking for Look Photo Biennial in the summer of this year. Um, so tonight's panel discussion is Rediscovering Urban Green Spaces and it connects to the nature focus of the lab. Um, so I'm joined by Alistair Small who will chair the, the discussion um, and it brings together Hilary Jack and Lizzie King, artists from the current You Belong Here, artists Rediscovering Salford's Green Spaces exhibition. Um, with the historian Carl O'Reilly to explore the radical past, present and futures of urban green spaces and the process of working with these places as sites of visual art production. So the panel will explore uh, what potential roles we might envisage, envisage for public parks, particularly in mitigating the effects of the climate emergency and reflecting on land use in urban areas and the social value of urban green spaces. Um, so as always, in the spirit of the lab, um, we would love if you can contribute to the discussion. So please feel free to get involved. You can submit your questions um, on the Twitch chat or on Twitter tonight. Um, so I'm just going to hand over to Alistair to introduce tonight's discussion and our speakers. So thank you for joining us. Hi, thanks so much, Soha. And uh, it's great to be here. So yeah, my name is Alistair Small. I'm Digital Content and Engagement Co uh, Officer at the University of Solwood Art Collection, um, primarily working on a digitization project of the university's art collection, but also thinking around creating avenues for engagement with the collection and programming events around the collection such as this, um, and generally kind of creating more routes to access the artworks in the collection. Um, I also, my other working uh, hat is for a community interest company called Manchester Urban Diggers, or MUD, C MUD CIC, um, which is a community interest company working to create food system change in Manchester and Salford by creating um, community-led food growing spaces, um, typically using underused or um, un or completely unused uh, land within urban spaces. Um, so I'm really happy to be joined this evening by Carol O'Reilly, the historian, <clears throat> and the artist Lizzie King and Hilary Jack to discuss, um, as, saw, as saw her mentioned, the, what roles we might envisage for urban green spaces in mitigating the effects of the climate emergency, um, and also thinking around the radical past, present and future of public parks and urban spaces. Um, so Carol is going to kick us off uh, by giving us some of that some of that context and that historical context around the foundation of public park spaces. Um, so Carol is senior lecturer in, in media and cultural studies at the University of Salford um, and received her PhD in history from Manchester Metropolitan University in 2009. Um, her research interests lie in urban spaces, public leisure and newspaper histories and her work is featured on the Great British Railway Journeys and BBC Radio 4. Her book, The Greening of the City, Urban Parks and Public Leisure 1840 to 1939, documents the history of public parks in Manchester, Salford, Liverpool, Old Preston, Leeds and Cardiff, and was published by Routledge in 2019. Um, so without the further ado, please do take away, Carl. Okay, thank you. Okay, hopefully everybody can see my screen. So uh, as Alistair said, um, we thought it would be good to start by just getting some context for Peel Park in particular, which was the locus of the project that Lizzie and Hilary are going to be talking about. Um, but also to give you some little information as well about the history of public parks in general, just in case people uh, are not very aware of that. Um, I've got a map here of the current layout of Peel Park in Salford. Um, it's quite unusual, as you can see towards the bottom there, it's actually got a river running through it, which is a relatively unusual feature for any public park. 
most public parks have got a water space like a boating lake, for instance, but not many have a river actually going through them. So just some background on Peel Park. Peel Park was one of three of the original first public parks established in Manchester and Salford. They were opened in August of 1846. Peel Park back then didn't quite, uh, wasn't quite as large as it appears on this map. It was only about 30 acres. It had originally been part of an estate called the Lark Hill Estate. Um, Britons had really started thinking about and talking about the need for public parks from about the 1830s. In those days, they were referred to as public walks rather than public parks, which gives you some idea of their original intention. And yeah, I think you can really see that still very much reflected in the design and the layout of Peel Park there. Look at those lovely undulating, twisting, turning walkways all of which were very carefully designed to open up vistas and views and to encourage people to explore the park at a fairly leisurely pace. The Peel Park, as you might know, is named for Robert Peel, great Victorian prime minister. His family donated some money for the purchase of the estate, so it was named in his honour. That was a pretty typical pattern, really, of the acquisition of land for public parks. Um, many local wealthy families either gave money or gave land, and the parks were very often named after them. However, the significant thing about Peel is that most of the money actually came from public subscriptions. So there was a campaign to raise money to buy the land. So the Peel family gave some money, but the vast majority of the money was given by the local people of Salford. So collections were taken in local factories and in local mills. And that's relatively unusual, actually. And I think it, it's one of the nicest aspects for me of Peel Park in that it is a genuine people's park. It really was funded and paid for by the people of Salford, who were, again, the people who mostly uh, used it and derived benefit from it. In terms of facilities, then, what does the park actually look like? What did it have in it? Like most public parks, Peel came pretty underdeveloped, really. Uh, if you look at very early maps of the park from about the 1850s, you will note the development of some very basic sporting facilities. So parks were not just for walks and leisurely walking. They were also from their earliest times very much used for sports and recreation. And the earliest maps of Peel Park show us that the park had uh, bowling facilities. It had archery butts right next to the river that I mentioned earlier. It had playgrounds for boys and girls. Boys and girls were very often segregated in terms of play in the Victorian era. It had Skittle Pavilion. It had a game called Quoits, which was a game where you threw a rubber ring over a, a peg that was uh, embedded in the ground. So it had quite a wealth of um, uh, facilities that people could avail of. And these were obviously very popular. It was a lot of those facilities actually that really drew people to the park in the first place. Peel also had this really spectacular archway. In 1851, Queen Victoria came to Salford and she came and visited Peel Park. And this was obviously a major social occasion, a major civic occasion. And this archway was erected to commemorate that visit. Um, unfortunately, if you go looking for it these days, it's no longer there. It was demolished in 1937 after it fell into a state of disrepair. So the other thing to note about these spaces is how flexible and how changeable they are throughout history. Um, they have really uh, expanded and developed. Things have been erected, things have been demolished. They're never the same space twice. So what did people do in these parks? Why did people visit these parks? That's actually quite a difficult question to answer in some respects because not many records have been left of uh, why, uh, explaining exactly why people went. But we know certainly from photographs like this one, um, that people did go and they went in droves. As you can see from this photograph, parks were really popular with women and with children. They were a great recreational resource for people, particularly those who didn't have much money and who couldn't afford to, for instance, go on a day trip out of the city. The local park was really everything to people. And this explains, I think, the importance of these kinds of urban green spaces. 
The other thing you'll notice from this photograph is how dressed up people are. People always dressed in their best clothes to go to the park. These days we might find that quite a strange thing to do, but a park again was some place where you were really on display. You were able to show people the best of yourself. And that was very much uh, behind the reason why people dressed up and wore whatever their best clothes were. Um, again, in some cases, those would have been quite limited, but nonetheless, people were determined to go out in public and to be seen wearing their very best and to show off their very best. <clears throat> Parks like Peel were also really large employers. Um, and we can see here two uh, very well-dressed gentlemen uh, who were employed in the park. Parks are very demanding places to uh, maintain. So the numbers of people employed in parks like Peel were enormous. The kinds and varieties of duties that they had were tough, difficult, arduous. It was all virtually outdoor work, sometimes in very bad weather, depending on the time of year. Nonetheless, these were jobs that were very prized. Uh, people enjoyed them. People held on to these jobs once they got them. <clears throat> Peel Park also features quite a bit in popular culture. Some of you might recognize this painting by, of course, the local artist L.S. Lowry. It also features a, a 1954 film called Hobson's Choice, which again, some of you might be familiar with. And it, Right here, you can see this fantastic panoramic view over the park, which really does showcase what a fantastic place it was for walking and for strolling. And you can see from this more contemporary photograph, um, the impact of the recent redevelopment of the park, which has sought to kind of conserve and reconstruct some of those original walking spaces. The other thing that parks have done is to kind of re-engage people's ideas with their local green space and the importance of green space. And one of the nice things I think that came out of the pandemic was driving so many people back to explore their local park. We were all limited in terms of the things that we could do and in the early stages of the pandemic, the places where we could go. And that reinvigorated parks really, I think for a lot of people, it reminded them how important these spaces are for physical health, but also for mental health. The Victorians didn't really think about mental health in the same way as we do, but they certainly thought about physical health and they knew that having access to a green space was a key to physical health for people, particularly the poor. So during the pandemic, a lot of people started to revisit their local parks. A lot of people were in some cases shocked and dismayed by the state that they found their local parks in, which is great because it meant that they were reinvigorated in their commitment um, to getting involved perhaps with their local park again. Um, and it's another reminder of just how important these spaces are as our towns and cities develop and develop rapidly during the 21st century. It's crucial that we take hold of these spaces, that we remind ourselves how important they are. Okay, they have moved along quite a lot since the early days of the Victorians, but the idea of rediscovering urban green space, which is the theme of this project, is really important for everybody. And it reminds us of just how important they are. Lots of people talk about parks in terms of value for money, in terms of the expense, the amount of money that it keeps to sustain them and maintain them. But actually, if you think about it in terms of what parks actually offer to people, it's unquantifiable in my view. It is not possible to put a price on these parks. So to just view them as kind of economic entities that have to pay their way or something that has to provide value for money is very reductive in my view, because I don't think there is uh, any formula that you could come up with that would really genuinely put a price on exactly what these parks mean to everybody. And part of the point of this project was to encourage people to rediscover their relationship with their local urban green space, hence the title of the project. So I'm going to hand over now to uh, Hilary and then to Lizzie to talk about their involvement. Um, just before I finish, I just wanted to remind you, Alistair already mentioned my book, The Greening of the City, which if any of you are listening who are from Liverpool does have quite a lot of information about the social history of Liverpool parks in there as well. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Carol. That was uh, really interesting. I think those questions around uh, non-economic value are something that we'll probably mm -hmm. touch on a bit later. I know we had a conversation a few weeks ago around 
some of the challenges that we've all faced in our work with with public green spaces and yeah. navigating some yeah. of those questions of of what's valuable about these spaces and whether that's purely economic or whether exactly. that is um more to do with well-being and health um yeah. but for now we'll hand it over to hillary jack uh, so hillary is an artist working across media with a research-based practice often resulting in site referential artworks sculptural installations and interventions in both gallery settings and the public domain her work has an activist element which comments on the politics of place and social political and environmental issues her work is in public and private collections including the government art collection Almova Sculpture Park in the US and Manchester Art Gallery. Along with Lucy Harvey, Hillary is also co-founder and director of Paradise Works Salford. Thank you, Alistair, that's great. Um, I'm gonna share my screen now and hope it works. Um, yeah, as Alistair said, I work across all media. So I just thought it'd be useful if I shared a little bit about my practice as an artist before I talk about You Belong Here, the exhibition at Salford Museum and Art Gallery. Um, so this is an image of my old studio, which is in Manchester, Crusader Mill. And um, I had a studio there for many, many years. Um, it's a building that I was very fond of at the time. It's now been uh, featured in the Manctopia um, documentary. Um, there were 90 to 100 artists in this building for over 20 years. And um, I had a studio on most of the floors in this building. Um, <clears throat> and this was my view from one of the windows that I had at, at a particular moment. Um, and I thought it'd be nice to share this with you because um, the building was a crumbling old mill and um, it had many bits of uh, buddleia growing out of it. And in the building, there were many sort of pigeons roosting and other birds. And every spring, a family of kestrels would come and raise their young in this uh, patch of buddleia that you can see, which um, over the years that we were there sort of took over the entire uh, wall of this building. Um, obviously, it's um, something that we're all familiar with are, you know, bits of um, weeds growing out of pavements and cracks in pavements in city centres and so on. Um, and this is around the back of that building. Um, in 2017, we were evicted from that building and it was turned into loft apartments. Um, all the uh, wildlife <clears throat> that um, lived there were also evicted. And around that time as well, so 2017, I was selected for the Spinning Fields Art Commission. Um, this is Spinning Fields. It's obviously a very different environment to what I was used to working in, about a 30 minute walk from my studio, um, a completely different environment. Um, the buildings are glass and um, metal structures, architect designed and designed specifically to keep wildlife and uh, weeds and other um, you know, sort of birds and, and, and there's no, no provision at all for any wildlife in this environment, concrete, glass and metal. Um, and you can just see here the sort of provision that they gave in this development, just a small patch of, of green space and a few spindly little trees. So when I sent my proposal in um, for this commission, um, I thought they could do with some plant life down there. Um, and I think that um, the commission, the proposal they asked for was that it would enhance the area in terms of greenery and in terms of environmental issues. It would highlight environmental issues. Allied London were the commissioner, so they own that land. Um, the land was um, also uh, very much a space where people weren't allowed to hang around, homeless people were moved on very quickly. Um, and, you know, there was no litter or anything like that. So a very different environment to where my studio was. So I basically proposed to install some plants into the fabric of the buildings in spinning fields. And I think Allied London probably thought I, I meant that I was going to put some nice um, flowers about the place and um, the the sort of proposal that I was proposing, they didn't quite realize the political implications of it. So um, these are actually bronze casts of wild plants and weeds 
that um, I collected from around my studio and around Manchester. Um, that's a detailed version of the body of plants. So these were cast in bronze by Bronze Cast UK. Um, they were very, very detailed and um, really beautiful objects in their own right. But what I did was install these into street furniture and some of the uh, fabric of the buildings around uh, spinning fields, many of which were banks or um, high-end restaurants and shops. And so this is um, in the main square, Hardman Square, um, one of the bronze weeds sort of um, installed into the top of this, this map. And another um, example here on uh, media.com, a media um, company, uh, many of the buildings were banks and there was a lot of money kind of swilling through this area um, and very high security as well. So getting permission to do all this was um, quite um, a task and I was really lucky to be supported by Castlefield Gallery while I was doing this. Um, Kwong Lee, who was the director at the time, um, managed to get the permissions for me to install these, um, these plants, actually weeds. Um, and um, some of them were in banks as well, or buildings inside. So this was a um, foxglove, a bronze foxglove um, installed into the heating duct in uh, Royal Bank of Scotland. And a Budlier plant installed into the wall at Coots Bank, uh, just as you went through the kind of security, uh, airport security style entrance. Um, and I think what I was trying to say with this project was that, um, you know, there is no provision in um, developments like this for environmental, um, you know, kind of uh, for greenery to grow. So the greening of a city is really not being um, mentioned here at all in any way um, in their proposal. So I was kind of trying to say in, you know, to get into their minds that they needed to put some greenery in this space and allow um, a bit more sort of um, reference to the climate and so on. And um, after, in recent years, they have actually added more green space. So I'd like to think that this project did have some kind of um, impact on their mindset. So this brings us to um, 2020 now, when University of Salford Art Commission um, Art Collection uh, commissioned me to do a new piece of work for um, You Belong here at the Museum and Art Gallery. And they allowed all the artists access to the archives at Salford Museum and Art Gallery. And um, this is one of the postcards that I found of lost buildings of Salford. And when I looked through the archive, I was really quite surprised that there were so many different architectural um, buildings in the landscape of Salford, which had been lost. Um, old mills, obviously, and then sort of mansion houses and um, buildings like this, which were owned by wealthy um, sort of merchants or bankers or mill owners. And many of these buildings have fallen into disrepair and uh, were taken over by wildlife, um, again, bodlier plants and so on, and birds nesting in the roofs of these places until they were um, demolished. Um, there was also a lot of back-to-back -back terraced houses um, in the area. And in the archive as well, there was um, loads of kind of ephemera letters by um, business people, uh, park, park attendants and um, all kinds of different sort of ephemera, which was really interesting to, to have access to. Um, and also original artworks by Ellis Lowry. Uh, this is a, a painting of a drawing that I was interested in, which showed the landscape when you're looking out over Peel Park and you can see really what Carol said, you know, the parks were very, very busy, full of people. And then in the background, you've got the spaces where people worked and beyond that, um, the places where they lived. So I thought it would be interesting if I could recreate this landscape in some way. Um, so I started to make some very simple drawings of some of the buildings that I'd seen in a kind of Lowry-esque pencil way, um, very simple, minimal sketches. 
um, because I thought it'd be interesting if I could make some models of this landscape, architectural models. Um, and so I went to a local fabricator, M3 in uh, Salford, and um, we started to draw up some models that could possibly be um, a kind of recreation of this landscape that I'd seen in the Lowry picture. I also had discovered that the Industrial Revolution had just a very detrimental impact on wildlife and birds in particular. Um, all their nesting sites were lost in a similar way to how um, the redevelopment of Manchester is, is also has a detrimental impact on wildlife. So I decided to make these into nesting boxes for birds. Um, and as many as I could make um, within the budget. So there was a sort of small village of um, nesting boxes uh, made in a, in, in, in a kind of um, like sort of architectural models. So this is one of them, um, one of the mills. So um, the idea here is that the holes are actually big enough for larger birds to get in. And um, some of them are for multiple occupancy. So um, this is the, the, the picture, the, um, the model you can see in the front is a, a multiple occupancy sparrow house. Um, and I thought this also kind of leads into a kind of hierarchy about uh, which, which places people lived. And I thought it would be great if we could have um, sparrows living in a mansion house um, and, you know, more exotic birds living in a less, uh, a, a less hierarchical um, building. Um, so this is another example of uh, one of the mansion houses that I, I had a model made for. So the install for the gallery, um, I had to work out how to how I could actually uh, do that in terms of the exhibition You Belong Here. And this was how it worked in the end. So um, the, this installation actually looks out, out over the Peel Park. There's a window to the right of this and you can just see Peel Park where this landscape would have been. Um, so they're elevated on these sort of table like structures, which are a little bit like a sort of topography kind of landscape. Um, the tabletops are all different shapes, a little bit like the contours of a map. Um, when the exhibition finishes, probably, um, I think it's in June, um, we're hoping that these can be installed into uh, trees and on buildings around Salford and in the park itself, perhaps, if we can get the permission to do that. So, um, yeah, these will, these will eventually end up outside in the public domain and hopefully become new homes for birds. So I think I'll leave it there because I, I think I'm running over time now. So thank you very much. I think so much, Ellie, that, that was really interesting. I think um, some of those questions around who natural spaces are for and particularly when thinking around uh, non-human inhabitants of cities as well um, and kind of thinking about whether parklands are actually beneficial or less beneficial for non-human species and um, again something for us to kind of maybe touch on a bit later um, but for now I'd like to invite uh, Lizzie King to give her presentation um, so Lizzie King was born and lives in Salford she graduated from the University of Salford in 2014 in visual arts and was one it was in the first cohort to receive the University of Salford Art Collections Graduate Scholarship Scheme She's since undertaken residencies in educational settings, teaching and expanding her practice. She's since exhibited in the UK, China, the USA and Spain. She works with printmaking and photographic techniques and has given talks on her work both for Red Eye and Open Eye Gallery. She's co-released a series of photographic books through, sold through Open Eye Gallery and the Photographers Gallery in London and the work is held in the University of Salford Art Collection. Thanks Alistair. Okay, I'll share my presentation. So if it's not going on to the next slide, please wave at me and let me know. Okay, so as Alistair just said, I'm Lizzie King. I am an artist working with photography and printmaking techniques. I'm going to give you a short overview of my practice and then talk to you about my work for You Belong Here. 
I've done a commission before for the University of Salford with the artist Craig Tattersall. This was a commission that looked at the old art building before it was demolished and they built a new building for it. This is one of the images for its studios. We created a human sized camera, which I would get inside and I had a photographic paper at the back of, which created these images then. So they're quite large, you can see 64 by 30 inches. There was a series of three of them in the series of works. The fourth image was this one, New Adelphi taken by Allerton. We went in the Allerton building at the University of Salford and turned the room into a camera. So there was a lens put on one of the windows and this there was a projection that was taken onto a board, exposed onto photographic paper. And this is the image of the new Adelphi building being built. So that's obviously the one with the cranes. And that's where the current fine arts and other arts practice degrees are taught. So it was really a commission about looking at the place and the changes and documenting it through the time. As I said, I'd done some residencies in educational settings. I did a residency at a high school and I wanted to document this by really looking at the dinner ladies and the workers in the school. So this was a series of six images that I created called Dinner Ladies in Baked Beans. So these are images taken on a analog film camera, which I then created a developer where the main liquid was the juice from baked beans. So that's why it gives it kind of like this weird dotty kind of quality that's going on. I was quite interested in having the process and the... Uh, what the image is about or having a link and there being a full documentation as such of really what was going on in the school and through the school lunches. I also work with printmaking techniques in my photographic work. So I created a series of chemigrams that look at space. This is dust cloud on Mars. Chemigrams are created by getting photographic paper and using chemicals to turn the paper different colours. I like to use fruit making techniques in these to create the different shapes and the different textures that I want in them. So this one is just cloud on Mars. And the next one, 500 million miles from Earth. So I hope that gives you kind of an overview of my practice. I quite like to Think about stories when I'm working and how I bring that out into uh, the final product and I think really that's the thread by the, the techniques the methods that I'm using I'd like to think that's the thread that really connects my work together so I will move on to the commission for you belong here we were given access to the digital archives digital Salford for the Salford Museum and Art Gallery. Um, as Carol's already given us quite an overview of Peel Park, uh, I'll talk, rather than trying to give you any more history, because I've covered it really well, I'll tell you about, as an artist and as a person, what kind of drew me to wanting to make work about Peel Park. I was particularly interested in a park that was just for people who could be of any people, for all the people of Salford and for Manchester. And the fact that it was paid for, a lot of it, as she said, by public subscription, that it was a part paid for by the people, for the people. And as I said, a lot of places before that seem to have been about people of wealth getting access to a lot of these beautifully cultivated pieces of land. Salford's history is, an industrial one of having many poor and a lot of poverty in a lot of people's lives and to have something which levels everybody out as saying you know what you deserve access to green space whatever your economic status is 
is something that really pulled me towards wanting to make work about Peel Park. I picked out this as one of the two pictures I'm going to show you from the archives. One, first of all, I quite liked it aesthetically. I like the, the contrast. I liked the way it's faded out. I like the gradiness to it. As an artist, aesthetically, that really pulls me towards it. And as Carol said, the way they're dressed is really interesting. It's like, this is a special day. It's not like, oh, there's nothing to do today, so we'll go to the park. They're taking out their families as a special event. They've got the best clothes on and they're going out to the park. And I was really thought that was quite an interesting note. And I like the fact as well that in this picture, we see the ladies and the families are all sat on the benches. The, this is a place for them all to be, to sit together, to meet, and to spend time together in the park. My next slide is a drawing by L.S. Lowry uh, called Peel Park. I also like this image as it shows people sat in the park, sat on the benches. But it's a different one in the sense that they're not a family. They're obviously not together, but they're enjoying being together whilst also spending time by themselves. It's that kind of sense of community where we can go to a park and I don't have to talk to you, but I know I'm not alone. And we know we're there together. I really started to look at the benches and the benches almost as a symbol of place for the people in the park. A symbol that's kind of saying, this is a place that you're allowed. You can spend time here. You can come, you can think, come and meditate. This is a place where you belong. And I think these two images have really shown that kind of thing. So I started to really think of that as the bed she's saying, you know, you belong here. This is a place for you. Whoever you are, you're able to access this and this is for you. Okay, so I created a dry point plate of one of the benches in Peel Park and use this as a photographic plate. I kind of wanted to add back to some of those older images that I've been looking at, like the one of the ladies and their families on the bench and get that kind of quality from it. So this created a 42 part um, projection from this plate here. As you can see in my dark room, the plate was put into the enlarger and exposed onto the photographic paper on the bed. And this led to the final image, which is belonging with the different 42 parts, which I hope has that kind of art back to the aesthetics of the old one, whilst really giving a highlight to the bench. I kept it in negative because I really wanted the bench to kind of shine out as this kind of symbol for its inclusivity, but also the kind of calm that you can get from going and sitting on that bench the meditative value of you know when you go to the park and you sit on the bench and you're quiet and you just listen and all of a sudden inside we're able to get rid of all that stuff that's going on and there's a lot more noise that we're here we're here with the wildlife all those birds and it just brings much a much better experience and we feel much better for it and a sense of community while we're doing it and I hope that's some of the feels that we could get from, from looking at the work. I'm going to share with you a few more images from the archive. So there was a lot of um, postcards in the ar digital archive. These are two that I've selected. So the first one at the top on the left is a Buell Hill Park in Salford. And the one on the right is Peel Park which shows us that really kind of iconic past structure going through. I liked the idea that people had these postcards as well, because it shows this how special it was. You know, this was something I'm going to tell you about when I've done it. I went on eBay and found quite a few of these postcards. I was able to read some of the inscriptions, and there was lots of people who had gone on holiday, and they were telling their friends about this part they'd gone to see whilst they'd been on holiday, or little notes from their day trips to their friends. These postcards that I bought are on display at the moment in the exhibition at the gallery, and also some of these ones from the archive. 
as you can see, the, this postcard particularly, it says it's Peel Park. Oh, the main building is the University of Salford building. And then this building, which is kind of jutted into the picture with the arched windows, is the Salford Art Gallery and Museum. Nowadays, the majority of what we see is Peel Park is behind the Salford Museum and Art Gallery. So I wanted to create something which kind of out back to that, those postcards and make a modern day version of that. So I created a series of six images called Rooted. The thought behind that being that all these things in the park, a lot of the nature, they have these roots that are set into the ground. And the bench is our physical thing that when we're in the park actually sets us as being part of the park. And we become part of that infrastructure of what this space is. It's a space that lets us know that we are meant to be there. So there's six images in sets of two. So the one on the left is the image of the bench. So that's about the being. The bench doesn't ask you to do anything except for sit and be. There's lots of other things in life that are asking us to do things, but that bench is literally for you to just be there. The image on the right is the view which is the same as like the seeing, the stuff that we can take in. We're at the park, we might see it's the nature, the flowers. There we can see the back of the Salford Museum and Art Gallery, and then further on, the university. It might be whatever's going on. And I wanted to create these as postcards so that people could share those experiences. We can sit and we can take our time like on the bench and we can think about them. But then when we write them down, we can kind of process it and then share it with other people. The hope for these postcards will that be that they'll be shared with people in our community who can't actually access the park. People, for instance, who are in um, care homes or long term hospital environments, because, as we said earlier, this is a park which was for the people of Salford all of them and I thought this would be a way of the exhibition and that kind of message being shared out with people whose access is limited. Okay so that brings me to the end of sharing about my work for you belong here so I'll hand back to thank you for listening to that. Oh, my mouse has disappeared I'll give me a second see if I click the right button there we go. Thank you. Thank you so much Lizzie. that was that was uh, again really interesting um, I think particularly those those questions around um, rest in public spaces and kind of again non non like true public spaces and it got me thinking around about kind of new new park developments and I wondered if uh, it might be worth potentially having a conversation around how we feel about new parklands being created in Manchester, for example. There's, I know there's plans to make a new park at what the former Mayfield station. Um, and this is actually, it's sort of a semi-public, semi-private thing. And it kind of reminds me a little bit of spinning fields and some of the things you were saying, Hilary, around um, them wanting to create more green spaces and more environmentally friendly spaces, but actually it being within private land. Um, and I guess like for me, I'm not sure whether it's a good thing or a bad thing. And I wondered how others felt around about that kind of that kind of initiative happening within cities, because obviously I'm sure there are many examples of that happening in, in other places as well. Um, yeah, are, is it a good thing or a bad thing? I think it's hard to say it's either one or the other, really. I think <clears throat> the public-private dichotomy is always a tricky one, as you've said. Um, Media City, I think, is another good example of that. It looks like public space, but it's actually private. If you take a camera out and start trying to take photographs, a security guard might come along and ask you what you're doing. So I think there are a lot of public spaces that look private and private spaces that look public. You know, there was a lot of debate in public parks about the kinds of things that people did in public parks. Because poor people particularly had so little domestic privacy, they would very often go to a park to find a private space, maybe to spend time with a girlfriend or a boyfriend. And a lot of people objected to that and were horrified by that. So uh, I welcome any new park personally, um, but I think what is public and what is private and what you can do in these spaces is often extremely contested. That makes them really interesting to me as a historian 
but it can sometimes make them very problematic in terms of people's behaviors and people's expectations. Mm. Yeah, Peter. I also think it's, um, you know, it, it, it's interesting to think that spinning fields was built so recently and so little, um, you know, kind of focus in that space was on the climate crisis or on green space. Um, you know, they have actually recently, I think I said before that um, they have installed recently more trees and grasses and so on, a sort of urban meadow. But, um, you know, it is just such a recent build. Why is it, why doesn't it all have green walls or green roofs or, you know, allotments on the roofs or just kind of, why is there not more um, thinking around this? Um, and so with private ownership of land, that is a real issue if these things are not embedded into government policy globally. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if we're in a situation where it is, it's coming from private sector to create these spaces, then I think we've reached you know it's quite it's quite a sad state of affairs to be in I think in some ways and I think I also as Carol said I would welcome any kind of new outdoor public space public space um but I think yeah there's always these questions around yeah public private and intention and ownership um I'm conscious of time I don't want to hog all the questions so we do have a question from Twitch um which would be, which is, would it be cool to have your own portable bench and place it where you want and invite strangers to join you? Personally, I think that sounds like an amazing idea. It's um, a fabulous idea. I can't think why we didn't do more of this before. Yeah, I love it. Yeah, portable we should introduce it. Yeah, yeah. portable sure, you benches. get lots of interesting conversations too. That. Yeah, yeah. Anything that brings people together, you know, and sometimes that often happens right now. You know, if you go to a park and you sit on a bench, chances are somebody will come along maybe with their dog and sit down you end up having a nice conversation and that's the lovely thing about parks they can be whatever we need them to be if you want to be as Lizzie was saying like completely quiet and meditative you can do that but if you want to be a little bit more open to chats and casual conversation you can do that as well and that's that's one of the things that I learned through my involvement in this project with the artist Jack Brown who I worked with is that these spaces can mean very different things to different people and the more we explore that and the more we bring together people like historians and artists who might not have worked together before the more you start looking at the space yourself and, and you I know I very rarely go to a park in Salford without someone stopping to have a conversation to tell me about their dog or <laughs> Something That's the nature I of you last week or yeah, anything. <laughs> Just very chatty people. But yeah, I think that's an interesting idea. Yeah. I think if you can put it in any view. Sorry, yeah. I think it's interesting as well that um, you know, when par parks are seen sometimes as places of fear, um, and you know, the more people that are actually in the park or in a space, um, the less fearful <laughs> perhaps yeah. we would be. Mm. So, mm -hmm. you know, if there were facilities that, you know, coffee machine, coffee uh, stalls and, you know, allotments or, you know, if the, the land was given over in that respect to a sort of working land, then, um, you know, there would be more people around. So it's not such a fearful place to go for some people if that's how it's perceived or, in fact, how it is. And if you look back at the Lowry drawings with the parks so busy as they were, um, music and other activities, you know, drew many people to the parks in that way. Mm. Yeah, I think that sense of the, the usage of parks kind of dwindling in some ways and becoming, as you say, like spaces of fear and spaces that which aren't particularly well lit, for example, and things like that. And I think, again, that question of value and usage comes in there as well. Um, and that kind of links to the, an interesting question in the chat as well. Um, which is, um, what do you imagine future parks will actually look like? Um, most at the moment are quite open and full of too many lawns and not actually that biodiverse. Mm. Um, so how might we reimagine those spaces in terms of how they might be used um, in that sense? Hilary? Yeah, I'd really like to see, um, you know, kind of pods with um, greenhouses in them and all kinds of activity going on in the park and the sort of work you've been doing, Alistair, is really interesting as well. Um, you know, just so that 
the parks are not lawns that are being driven around, you know, big lawnmowers aren't being driven around on them, you know, with loads of emissions coming out of the lawnmowers. You know, they could be more like grassland or um, much more like an urban meadow and uh, with plants that are just really diverse and not the sort of plants that are pulled out every year just for civic pride um you know those those kind of things that are planted and then thrown in the bin after a few months so um yeah i think they should be productive spaces and places for play um you were talking about how one of the areas that you were working in alistair um was an allotment and then mm -hmm. the council was suggesting they turned it into a um a yeah. golf course or something <laughs> you know it's yeah. like so short-sighted yeah yeah exactly and i think i think something that i've just sort of maybe like crystallized a little bit in my head is this are we sort of in a moment in which these spaces are shifting from being spaces of leisure um as they always have been towards spaces which need to be kind of leisure and some sort of productivity like you know um some sort of um greater biodiversity, more community engagement, more community um, kind of ownership of these spaces. Um, I think I think that's kind of been happening for a while, really, you know, um, volunteers and friends groups. Friends groups are a fantastic yeah, resource absolutely. and a fantastic way of kind of harnessing community involvement and getting people involved in, you know, wild meadows and rewilding and all this kind of stuff. I think it's so important that people feel a sense of ownership in the park, that they don't feel excluded. As Hilary said, you know, that there aren't all these pristine manicured lawns that people are afraid mm. to set foot on. Um, we've got to make them something that embraces everybody um, mm. and try not to alienate people. And I think if you look at the history of the development of parks in relation to the horticultural aspects and the planting, you know, the earliest parks were really kind of densely planted and everything was labelled so that people could learn what the plants were. And then they could go and buy the plants and put them in their own garden. And people rebelled against that eventually. They got fed up of it and they, they said quite openly, this is not what we want to see. We want to be able to do other kinds of things in a park than just go and look at a flower bed. And, and that's where you got the real kind of evolution uh, of parks in kind of the mid 20th century. And they became these multifaceted spaces. And I, th I still think kind of preserving that is quite important, that they're not too formal, that they're not too empty. But, you know, getting back to Lizzie's idea of them being a space where everybody belongs, potentially. Yeah, yeah I think the idea of having something which is quite um, diverse, as you said, because you get lots of families who want to go there and play on the laws. So I think the laws are important in some way. And for, like with Peel Park as well, with the amount of flooding that happens around there, having large amounts of... Um, uh, place where water can be soaked up is important mm. but also as you say having diverse plants in it and other things that can make it more eco-friendly and more inviting to the environments that they're in I just I think there's space for all those things in a lot of our parks without them being um, overdone as such you know without being overcrowded mm. yeah I mean, I think the use of, of public and private land is something that is just so important to the, the uh, discussion with climate crisis, because, um, you know, we have to use that land as best we can to combat climate change. And if you think about private ownership of land, so I read a statistic the other day that the Queen owns 6.6 .6 billion acres of land. So imagine if that was all rewilded or was productive in some way. Um, mm. You know, we can only do so much as individuals. And while it's great that we all have our own little patch of land, perhaps a window box or a small back garden or even a bigger space, it's still not enough. You know, we have to have much, much more. So why is it not happening? Mm. Yeah. Well, I think that also links to a question in the chat around value and investment. Um, so I'll just, I'll read that. So a question regarding value. Despite the re rediscovery of parks during the pandemic, there has been very little increase in investment. A poultry amount, for instance, in the levelling up fund. Uh, if we're not thinking about value for money and return on investment, then how do we advocate for increasing investment and how should it be distributed slash allocated? For example, locally, nationally, for heritage value, for wellbeing. 
um, great you... question, but you know, uh, it would be great if we had an, an easy answer. <laughs> I certainly don't. Um, I think one of the problems when, when you're looking at, uh, I hate the whole word value and, and applying monetary value to parks is, is awful in some terms, but in other terms, you know, parks cost money. They need funding, they need budgets, they need to be kept uh, to be maintained. They need to have new things added so people will keep coming back. If it just looks the same all the time, there's no reason for people to return to it. Um, there, there's whole levels of responsibility, obviously, national government responsibilities, there are local government responsibilities, there are the responsibilities of funders like the heritage bodies. And I think that's part of the problem is you've got all these different groups of people, all of whom say they love parks and they want parks and they want to protect parks. But once you get them all in a room, you find out that they all want completely different things. And I have uh, direct experience of this myself. I'm very closely involved with Heaton Park in Manchester. And it has taken us something like 12 years. I'm part of the Friends of Heaton Hall to get the council to um, address a, a very important architectural building that was in a very bad state of repair. So it takes a long time and it takes enormous tenacity on the part usually of local people to confront these different bodies to try and bring them together and to try and get everybody working in the same direction. That is not an easy win overnight. It takes a very long time and a lot of dedicated local commitment. So the, the answer isn't easy, I'm afraid, but the problem isn't easy either. Mm. Yeah, I think that sense of like, these being contested spaces with many different agendas or battling for ownership or part ownership, um, Again, there's another question in the chat. Um, someone who set up a community land trust to take back a council-run park into community ownership. Um, any advice how to go about it? I think, again, it's a question of persistence and yeah. advocacy and yeah. um, providing alternatives and solutions. And yeah. I think from from the, um, the work that I do with MUD, a lot of that's been a really long process. I've, I've only recently joined mm. it, but in terms of their foundation, like there's a lot of advocating for how that space can be used. Um, so A, to grow mm. food, but also to provide social prescribing and green prescribing. Um, yeah, very important. So I think it's that, that question of uh, creating value. Again, this word value, but it's about kind of creating alternative systems of value and kind of thinking about these spaces as... Um, mm you know, how they can be used in other ways, particularly spaces which aren't, aren't being used for anything. So, yeah. for example... And as you say, it, it's it's a question of persistence, you know. It's, mm -hmm. Councils hope people will go away eventually if they, if they don't do anything over time. <laughs> that was my experience. And so the more you persist and the more you show you won't, the more then they'll engage with you because they'll realise they have to. So yeah, be prepared for the long term. But if you can stick it out, you you will definitely get there and you will definitely get action. And if you keep bringing it up every time there's an open election and somebody calls to the door and asks for your vote, that works. That really does work because every local elected politician wants to be reelected. And if you make it clear that it is contingent on a particular space or a particular park or, or something like that, then that, that can get really good traction as well. Yeah. Are there any other kind of questions or comments from from the panel or from the from the audience? I think just that last uh, question in the chat from PD Bing's this point mm -hmm. about what is offered to engage young people in parks. I think that's a really really vital question, and I'm not really sure that parks are doing a lot for this. You know, some parks are offering things like skateboarding parks. A lot of uh, local authorities are completely against that kind of thing because they see it almost as akin to antisocial behavior. Uh, and I think you've got to engage people from an early age with parks uh, to make them sustainable and to make people invested in them. And I think a lot of the times with parks, particularly local authority parks, they're not really offering anything for young people or what they're offering does not engage young people at all. So I think more open-mindedness, I think from my point of view would be very welcome. Mm. I think one of the positive things I think I've seen in Peel Park and some other parks is like the park run. I think a lot of younger people see those as really yes. enjoyable and positive for the mental health and that kind of engagement. So I think they're really great. But I say, I'm sure this more 
things that people could come up with, but I think those are really interesting uses for the space as well. And actually, I think once you set foot into a space and you get used to going there, you'll use it for other purposes as well as just your initial involvement in the park. Mm. Absolutely spot on. I think that, you know, after the lockdowns as well, you know, people really have valued open spaces, um, outdoor spaces, however large or small. And um, one of the artists at Paradise Works made a film, Danielle Swindles, it's still available, I think, um, on the Manchester International Festival website, and it's called Capturing a Summer. Um, and in that documentary that she made about the summer of lockdown, she um, documented people going out into the parks um, and open spaces, sometimes bits of wasteland, where um, they were kind of making up games, sort of um, different kinds of games with, you know, running around a tree with a bungee strap and setting up sort of uh, impromptu competitions every lunchtime at the same time. Um, some of them were absolutely hilarious. Um, and other things were just, you know, gathering a group together to play um, ball or something, you know, tennis or something like this. So um, I think after that time, you know, this, this recent couple of years, you know, we really value our outdoor spaces. And hopefully that will lead to some more activities. I also think that, you know, it, the reduction in crime um, when an, an empty space, a, waste, a piece of wasteland, a patch of land is taken over by a community or cleared um, in that way to, to make a, a garden or, or just a, a clear space where people can, can uh, gather. Um, it has such a positive impact on, on the local area. And we've seen that Paradise Works with the... Um, community garden outside our building crime rates have reduced massively because there are people in that garden walking their dogs or gardening planting vegetables and so on and that was previously just um, a patch of wasteland with brambles and old canisters and all kinds of uh, crap thrown onto it you know so it really has a positive impact if you can have some sort of community activity um, on land. Mm. And I think that that project at Paradise Works is really interesting in terms of thinking around what can be a park and what can become a park um, and kind of creating parks from scratch, like as, as a community as well. Mm. I wonder if, um, if we have a little, I know we're a little bit over time, but I wondered if it might be useful to talk a little bit about that process, Hilary, around creating that community garden kind of from the ground up. Yeah, I can do. And I think it leads into the sort of past history of our building, actually, Erwell House, which was a, an urban farm before um, uh, we took it on. Mm. And um, it had been run as an urban farm, which was another Manchester International uh, Festival project. Um, it had sort of fish tanks inside and uh, lettuce growing and mushrooms and um, chickens on the roof and so on. But um, sadly, it, it was it, it failed in the end um, when funding and one or two um, issues arose. Um, but the legacy of that, I think, was that when we took on that building, we wanted that patch of land to be returned in some way to how it was. It was a, it was originally an allotment for for um, the uh, biospheric project that that was the what the uh, what the project was called, and um, it was it was just something that we tried to do. We had uh, this kind of utopian build a vision of what we would do in that space and the building itself. Um, and so we started to clear some of the rubbish from a very small corner of that, that uh, patch of land. Um, unfortunately, we couldn't get support from the council at that time, but the local community uh, got involved as well. Unfortunately, there were a couple of people on that, uh, that group, in, within that group, neighbors of Earlwell uh, House, who um, really took it forward. They, they persisted with the council as Carol um, suggested people do. And um, they also got some funding from, um, I can't remember actually where they got the funding from, but it was a community gardening group um, uh, su supporting them. So they, they suddenly had a bit of money which enabled them to, to carry on and get some materials and so on. And then as that has gone forward, um, Paul Dennett, the uh, mayor of Salford has got involved and also 
been really supportive of that along with a couple of counsellors so it's now a really nice space with vegetables you can grow and a, a little walking a little path you can walk along um, and it's all cleared and fruit trees are growing so yeah it's been a really fascinating project how it's developed and it it has had a really positive impact the surrounding area is residential there's a couple of tower blocks um, nearby so during the lockdowns, you know, that space became incredibly important for people. Um, yeah, so it, it has a massively positive impact on the area and the people living there and their health and well-being. Yeah, I think that provides like an amazing um, kind of alternative, sort of if, if the parks we have at the moment aren't doing what we need them to do or want them to yeah. do, and how can how can we create our own green spaces? And I think Paradise Work shows that you you can do that. Um, you know, I should just add, hard. however, that you know that space is council owned, and um, it's on a short lease. I'm not really sure. It's all yeah. very uh, woolly. How the, what the future holds for that space? I know mm -hmm. that a developer wanted to um, build houses there, um, and. Um, yeah, it's one of those things, isn't it? You know, how long can you hang on to these patches of land which are worth so much economically to developers? Yeah. Yeah, that's really unfortunate, isn't it? And I think it's also about, you know, changing our definition of what we think a park is. A park does not have to be a massive piece of green space with a lot of flowering plants and a bandstand. Um, if any of you have been to New York, you might have been to the High Line which is a park that they've created there on an elevated disused railway line. It's what's called a linear park. So it's, it's literally in a line. It doesn't really feel like what we think of as a park when you're in it, but it's amazing. It's an amazing space. And I think there are some moves in some parts of the country here to make parks, such linear parks on uh, disused railway lines, which I think is a really, again, an, you know, another great idea. Another different actually... kind of space. Sorry to interrupt. I think there's actually a plan in Manchester to do that in um, the disused overground um, railway. Um, yeah, that's right. That would be fabulous. Mm. Yeah. Well, I think that sounds like a positive note to kind of draw things together on. Um, unless there's anything, anything else anyone else likes to add. But um, otherwise, thank you all so much for your your time this evening and your contribution has been a really interesting discussion I think um, I think it's it's a really important issue particularly in urban spaces and how we kind of use the spaces we do have and how again I think from the chat there's a lot of interest in how communities can be more involved in spaces and how people can kind of advocate for using using green spaces more and more um, so yeah it's been really interesting so thanks thanks everyone Thank you. Thanks, everyone.